Thank you, Sam. Um, Robert T. Cashin is known to all of his friends and most of his enemies as Ty. Um, and that's what we're going to call him today. Uh, Ty is professor of history at Sam Houston State University in Huntsville. He, is the, he was the co-editor with Jesus Frank de la Tea of The Human Tradition in Texas. And he's the author, is the author of a book that I really uh, treasure because I'm from that part of the country, just a little bit further north, uh, of a Texas frontier, the Clear Fork country, in Fort Griffin, 1849, 1887. It's a, it's a wonderful book about people becoming Westerners who start out as Southerners and, and how the combination of environment and, and context uh, turns those people into really a new kind of Texan in the years uh, uh, around the, uh, the, the beginning and, and, and duration and, and end of the Civil War. Um, it's uh, over the period before and after the Civil War, I should say. Um, Ty's writing has uh, resulted in his induction into the Texas Institute of Letters. Uh, for the past several years, he's been interested in a question that haunts many of us, and that is the question of Texan uniqueness. Um, is Texas ex exceptional? Uh, he wrote, uh, any of us who subscribe to the Western Historical Quarterly also get a special deal uh, that is getting it free, um, the Montana Magazine of History. Uh, and Ty's work on Texas uh, miraculously showed up in the Montana Magazine of History, I guess, Ty, because nobody in Texas would publish it. Um, it's called, What's the Matter with Texas? Um, What's the matter with Texas, the great enigma of the Lone Star State in the American West? Actually, it's a really, a really insightful study of how historians of the American West and to a certain extent of the Old South have had, a, have had, have had difficulty in, in, in incorporating Texas with all, in, in all of its aspects into their interpretation of the West or the South I think it was Senator Dollar Bill Blakely back in the 1950s who, when asked if Texas was Western or Southern, just said, Texas is Texas, and we're going to leave it at that. Um, Ty insists on not leaving it that, uh, not leaving it at that answer, but of challenging what he calls the myth of Texceptionalism. Uh, so get out your tomatoes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, 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 I will sit as far away from Ty as I can, and, and Sam will be safe because he'll be even further away from me. But, but, but uh, I, no, really hold back until you hear what he has to say uh, uh, about the, the myth of Texceptionalism or Texas exceptionalism. Dr. Cashin. Thank you for the introduction, Jim. And before I begin, let me uh, take a, just a second here to acknowledge the good work of the Friends of the San Jacinto Battleground for the, uh, for the good work that they do in preserving the legacy of this signal event in Texas history. I'll set my water here so I don't. I've been known to, to be a spiller from time to time. But uh, I don't have a, a PowerPoint, but I do have a a prop. I'm, I'm kind of old school here. So I'd like to share this with you. It's my print entitled San Jacinto Spring Day uh, by a promising young artist named Van Jones who died tragically young before he got famous. But like most art, uh, it's idealized. It's minus the industrial defects of rust and derelict junk. In fact, if you get on Google Earth, this scene would, would look much different than it does here. But I like this piece because it conveys tranquility. It connects the past with the present, and it allows you to interpret it just about any way you want. When my mother first saw it, she said she remembered watching them build this monument when she was a little girl. She lived on a farm in, in Sheldon, uh, not far from the San Jacinto Monument, and uh, not having electricity. Uh, she said what fascinated her was the, the little red light on top of the monument. She would just, just stand there and stare at it for, for a long, long time. But uh, I also have a print of the Alamo that I didn't bring. Uh, my best friend gave it to me when I got my PhD back, uh, back in the day. And it's not idealized. 
In fact, uh, it's a transmogrified version of McArdle's Dawn of the Alamo that would make that nightmare scene look idealized. Uh, my friend's view of the Alamo, though, is, is like that of most true Texans, pretty much one-dimensional. Uh, I've since set him straight. No doubt, though, this is one crowd that can appreciate the Alamo and all its complexities as an iconic representation of the universal struggle for freedom. It belongs not just to Texas, but to the world. No doubt, too, that you're familiar with the sarcophagus nearby and the inscription that says Thermopylae had its messengers, the Alamo had none. Well, despite such, such poignancy and prominence, for Texans, there's another, another battle that's all their own, the one we're here to, today to commemorate. That said, consider this Texas brag. It took the Mexican army 13 days to take the Alamo, but in less time than it would take to watch an episode of King of the Hill. And you could fast forward through the commercials. The self-styled Napoleon of the West met his Waterloo at San Jacinto. Until some time after World War II, school kids would get that day off. But during my adulthood, I've watched the anniversary of, of San Jacinto come and go uh, with scarcely a mention in the local newspapers across the state. So for the past few years, uh, every April 22nd, uh, I've turned to the letters to the editor to gauge the level of indignation on the part of true Texans. One of my favorites published in the, the Houston Chronicle went like this. It said, Happy San Jacinto Day. How come I didn't see you recognize the Texans who fought for your freedoms? Is it A, because you don't care? B, you don't know your history? Or C, you are, you are afraid it will anger your Hispanic readers. Well, as a classroom professor who throws together many a multiple choice quiz, let me tell you, I've found that the best questions usually involve a, a correct answer in the range of choices. So with that aim in mind, let me add a fourth. <laughs> you like that? My students like that. <laughs> let me add a fourth and correct selection. And it would be D, Texans no longer have a usable past. You allow that to sink in for a minute. Here's where the tomatoes uh, come out. But uh, before you throw any, let me suggest that, that we've not lost our regard for the freedom that San Jacinto represents, far from it. You know, when you stop and think about it, my gosh, if the anniversary of, of vanquishing a, a ruthless dictator like Santa Ana who threatened to, uh, to run our Tejano and Texian forebears from the land or bury them under it, uh, if that doesn't make you want to run outside and pop a few firecrackers, you know, there's not just a whole lot about our 19th century past that we can openly celebrate. So let me ask you, how come we don't? Well, quite simply, it's because the traditional history that has so long represented the usable past that Texans embrace is not so usable anymore. I'll explain this at length, but for now, consider this. While a new usable past, one that's capable of both capturing the popular imagination of Texans and appealing to their collective intellect, lacks an identifiable meta-narrative to give it form and context, its components are nevertheless accruing um, with subtle but excuse me, but with subtle and inexorable force in the form of an increasingly progressive historiography that tells a richer, more accurate, and more inclusive story than the traditional Texas history. It's about time, too. Because if Texans want to be players on the world stage in the 21st century, they'd better start cultivating a range of vision capable of seeing beyond their own borders. And that kind of perspicacity begins with a firm grip on reality, which will demand an enabling history rather than an empowering myth. What I call the, the San Jacinto disconnect explains it best. That is, this dichotomy between histories that enable and empower. As I just suggested, Every true Texan knows that the 1836 battle at San Jacinto represents the pivotal event in the state's history. 
In the space of, of 18 minutes, the geopolitical world as Mexico knew it changed abruptly and irreversibly. At the same time, a cloud has emerged over the battlefield uh, in the, uh, regarding the meaning of San Jacinto and the historical cosmos of the people who claim its legacy. Anglo-Texans, or Texians as they preferred, in one mighty throw wrested their independence from the bloody grip of a ruthless dictator who promised no quarter for insurrectionists. For men and women of color, though, including the Tejanos and African Americans who supported this separatist movement alongside the Texians, it was only the locusts for establishing the legal guidelines of their wiggle room in society that it really changed. The generation's long toil to gain the same liberties and freedoms that the Texians secured in one fleeting moment represents a cause that only recently has become regarded by reflective minds as universally American. Trouble is, not all Americans, including most true Texans, acknowledge the legitimacy of such a principal assumption, and for good reason. Look at it this way. How can true Texans sustain the high tone of their bragging when the legacy of protecting and preserving everything they won on April 21st, 1836, so often represents the very prize that people of color, and women of all colors for that matter, we're striving to obtain. And there is your San Jacinto disconnect. The duality in the way Texans approach their history would really not be much of a contest if anyone outside of Texas gave more than a passing attention to Texas history. As you heard Jim Crisp say, if you keep up with historiography of the American West and the, and the South, uh, you'll know that, that Texas plays little part in uh, in those, those regional histories where at one time it played a prominent part. But even inside the state's academy, the premise that scholars generally embrace uh, is that, that Texans, regardless of background, Texans, regardless of background, are one people who share a common experience. No one, no one owns the proprietary right to tell how we got here from over yonder. The story that belongs to people of color as well as women in different ethnicities and social classes, from their point of view, no less, is just as legitimate as that of the Anglo-Texan male. Now, directly ahead of us, consider this, directly ahead of us lies a new age that's unavoidable, where the limits of the global frontier, the environment, and American imperialism are already in view. To continue seeking an identity and values in a 19th century frontier ethos of rugged individualism, social Darwinism, and manifest destiny seems not only antediluvian, anti but quite dysfunctional as well. The inferences that Texans can draw from this dilemma could not be clearer. The old frontier closed long ago, and only now are we coming to realize that what worked for Texans in the 19th century did not work nearly as well in the 20th. Imagine navigating the present century with a 19th century mind and draw your own conclusions. Yet, this remains the usable past that informs the history of true Texans who cling to it with a passion. I keep tossing around this term, true Texans. Well, to understand the problem at hand, uh, this, this loss of a utilitarian history, uh, you have to understand what a true Texan really is. Uh, T.R. Fehrenbach, I know all of you know T.R. Fehrenbach, an unapologetic true Texan, if there ever was one, established himself as the popular authority on the state's history in 1968 with the publication of Lone Star, A History of Texas and the Texans. In Fehrenbach's estimation, Anglo-Texans who arrived during the 1820s quickly found themselves besieged by enemies on every side and became locked in a winner-take-all endurance contest. They emerged on the other side of an experience that was so unique in American history that they represented to him a veritable ethnicity. Now, we don't have time to set this in the, in the context of American exceptionalism, but 
if you stick a T in front of the term exceptionalism and you let your mind wander a little bit, uh, well, you'll get a general idea of what exceptionalism uh, is. Uh, Fehrenbach declared that his true Texan represented the perfection of the old American stock who rested, quote, who rested the land from the wilderness, the Indians, and the Mexicans. Now, this unique breed of American presented a stark contrast to Indians and Mexicans, and presumably by his omission from this rationale, African Americans, who could never be true Texans by his measurement. But still, the part that people of color played is no less important in the traditional history. I mean, after all, someone had to play the role of foil um, without contrasts of a mudsill class and losers of the West to magnify true Texans' notions of rugged individualism, folks might begin to look around and, and wonder what kind of historical legacy has left most of them with nothing but swagger to show for all the swag that their forebears squeezed out of the land and the original inhabitants. Now, the work of this untrained, self-described gentleman scholar quickly became the Texas Bible, so to speak, going through six reprintings and a second edition in 2000 that really it wasn't a new edition, it was the same old history distended by, uh, by an additional uh, chapter. But even then it was a pretty thin chapter. But remember I said that Texas history is informed by the 19th century? Well, Fehrenbach did not reach the 20th century until the 35th chapter of a 37 chapter book. To the credit of the intellectual community in Texas, Lone Star uh, was generally condemned. If one comment encapsulated the sentiments of university-trained historians, it was expressed by University of Texas professor Lewis Gould, who wrote, all in all, this book is a failure and serves only to underscore the dangers that await the unwary dilettante who attempts the serious business of writing the history of an important American state. Well, on the contrary, this book was not a failure. Uh, Lone Star was and continues to be a resounding success, even if for all the wrong reasons. Despite the validity of every caustic observation made by scholars, none of it mattered in the estimation of men and women who were receptive to the meta-narrative that it presented. Folks who never opened an issue of the American Historical Review I developed a, a, a reverential regard for this flawed but magnificently epic volume. Most of them, in fact, met it, uh, read it more than once, and many of them read it many times. Uh, what true Texans found inside Fehrenbach's labor of love was a wellspring of pride and inspiration. Actually, there was nothing original about his estimation of the Texas identity. Uh, it was nothing more than the bald summation of what Texas historians had always said. Uh, it's fair enough to attribute the 19th century experience of Anglo-Americans in general to the racial attitudes and cultural imperialism that characterized their values and actions. A more troubling implication comes into view once the West was won, however. The white hats that true Texans wore in the 19th century looked more like white hoods in the 20th. In the tradition Sam Houston tried but failed to establish in the 19th century, there were always plenty of Anglo-Texans of conscience who actively supported social justice throughout the 1900s, but their social and political heritage does not evolve from true Texans, as Fehrenbach made clear. In another publication, he snarled that, quote, virtually all the political and social reforms of the 20th century, including civil rights and feminist movements, have been forced down the Anglo-Texan throat. These and other forms of what he called compulsory hypocrisy only hardened their beliefs. You know that the, the 20th century begins on page 632 in Fehrenbach's 719-page narrative history of the state, suddenly makes a heck of a lot of sense. Uh, not many Texans are, are aware of the militantly rebarbative sentiments he expressed 
And I figure that if made aware, many of them might recoil at that kind of fiery rhetoric that would suggest that perhaps their usable past is not quite as usable as they had figured. In the spirit of intellectual discourse, though, why then do true Texans so ardently cling to their interpretation of the past? In part, this myth survives because it has been so indelibly printed on atavistic minds that respond to fiery rhetoric, let me tell you. There are others who have evolved for whom the collective memory at least informs their self-perception. There is yet another issue keeping the cold, dark heart of exceptionalism beating that true Texans who stand at the political and economic levers of power and influence might prefer not to discuss. But let's talk about it anyway. Society's betters, by indication of means, have a tremendous material stake riding on the survival of exceptionalism. It represents a bond of kinship uniting them with the unwashed masses of true Texans whose general interests and welfare would otherwise pit them at odds. You know, there are few plain folk anywhere who are bigger suckers for a God and country pitch than, than true Texans who fell out the ranks of the foot soldiers. And you know what, though? They're so easily exploited because you won't find plain folk anywhere who are more reflexively loyal to their God and to their country. Just so you know, I'm not suggesting there's a conspiracy afoot. Uh, to the contrary, the only mystery here is why we so seldom acknowledge the obvious demagoguery of self-anointed self guardians of the people's interests. You guys are all familiar with H.L. H. L. Mencken, I'm sure, America's most trenchant critic, who um, often made them the object of his ripping wit and sarcasm. He regarded a demagogue as, quote, one who preaches doctrines he knows to be untrue to men he knows to be idiots. <laughs> At the same time, he expressed no sympathy for the objects of their pandering. What may be called, by a shotgun marriage of Latin and Greek, the demislave, Mencken explained, is he who listened to what these idiots have to say and then pretends that he believes it himself. Now, demagogues, uh, demoslaves. Well, you'd think by now they'd get it. But hardworking true Texans pulling on the short end of the rope in a tug-of-war where their own approval represents the prize seem just as receptive as ever to the same old message in whatever form it takes. By the way, I'm the son of a Texas high school football coach. And I teach Texas history, so I beg your indulgence for some spicy language I'm about to use here. So uh, uh, please indulge me there. But in these perilous economic times, where an underinsured illness, loss of livelihood, or facing retirement just in time to find there ain't no nest and there ain't no egg are very real prospects, true Texans can take, co can take comfort in an instructional past where the pioneers grabbed their butt with both hands, as the old coach might have said, and jerked themselves out of whatever predicament they were in. From their vantage atop the heap of society, demagogues are quick to remind their kindred true Texans that our forebears left as their inheritance a land of unlimited opportunities and that anything standing between them and free and unfettered capitalism is just plain old-fashioned communism. Think I'm reaching? Remember, during the, the months preceding the financial meltdown in 2008, when our only average folks could fear the barometric pressure of the economy so precipitously dropping, former Texas Senator Phil Graham had repined that, that we, we've become a nation of whiners. Translation, grab your butt with both hands and start jerking. Scarcely a couple of months later, Graham's phlegmatic former colleague on the other side of Washington's big top, Tom DeLay, went on a talk radio program and, and sized up uh, then Democratic presidential candidate Barack Obama. Quote, hey, I've said it publicly and I'll, I'll say it again. Unless he proves me wrong, he's a Marxist. Translation, 
Anything standing between me and free and unfettered ca uh, capitalism is just plain old communism. Now, if you're wondering what all this has to do with Texas history and San Jacinto, it has everything to do with Texas history and San Jacinto. Put yourself in the place of the Texas demoslave and consider what too many doses of reality might do to your mind and your mood. When confronted with a snapshot that contradicts your big picture, it's only natural to make it fit by, well, by rationalizing a credible scenario or just declaring it an anomaly. You certainly would not abandon your understanding of the past on the evidence of an occasional challenge that gives you pause. How many times, however, could you continue to cavil until you reach a point where you finally realize you've been humbugging yourself, as the old populace might have expressed it? It is the collective memory of the true Texan that informs the demagogue's mantra. We, the products of persistence and rugged individualism, must join forces against the threat du jour. Well, in the long view, that threat has taken the form of Mexicans, of Indians, of Negroes, of, of communists, of liberals, of feminists, and terrorists. Did I leave anybody out? Well, oh, all kinds of things. Uh, you know, through, through time. I mean, uh, and you know what, what gets me? Talk about your disconnects. You know, I thought as a Texan, we're supposed to be the roughest, toughest people on the planet. But by this measurement, I think that if we're afraid of, of Mexicans and Indians and Negro, that maybe we're not quite as rough and tough as we thought we were. Well, that said, the bet noir for true Texans pulling on the long end of the rope is the prospect of reaching a critical mass that represents the fatal dose of reality, leading true Texans pulling on the short end of the rope to let go abruptly. If that day arrives, the social and political order as we know it will be up for grabs. And you think history is not a, a powerful thing. It's very powerful. But in the meantime, we can take for granted that Texas traditionalists will continue to insist that their collective memory remains the only valid history of the state and to attribute the encroachment of other ideas and voices to political correctness. Now, in an environment where talk show pundits tell the rabble that FDR's New Deal created the Great Depression, and with a straight face, no less, uh, any construction of the past seems possible. Notwithstanding some epic weirdness, however, the traditional interpretation of Texas history as encapsulated in the work of people like T.R. Fehrenbach will inevitably, inevitably take its rightful place in the historiography uh, somewhere this side of Parson Weems and Sir Walter Scott. Personally, I believe that day will come sooner than anyone suspects and that it will explode upon us with suddenness when the right issue provides the spark. That progressive canon is simply growing too big to ignore. And it's not just Texans who are adding to it. So often when, when some interloper writes our history, true Texans will, will just blow it off. They'll dismiss it and say, oh, you don't understand, partner, because you're not a Texan. Well, when the, the repost, no, you don't understand because you are a Texan. When that repost gains traction, all bets are off. Well, to bring things full circle, let me admonish the petulant Texan who chastised the newspaper editor for failing to acknowledge San Jacinto Day. Be careful what you wish for. This signal event in our state's history does not resonate like it once did because the traditional narrative has fallen out of step with the collective memory embraced by a majority of Texans in the present age. The importance of San Jacinto Day has not diminished yet to become an event that again informs our self-identity may require us to reconstruct our mental architecture of the world and our place in it, as a wise colleague once said. It will have to convey a fuller context that commemorates it as a day full of promise for some Texans and a day fraught with peril for other Texans. And make no mistake about it, ultimately San Jacinto Day is not just worth commemorating, it is worth openly celebrating because Texas at long last is evolving into a land of opportunity that, that knows no color. 
any usable past that emerges from a truly Catholic survey of the Texas experience, that is Catholic with a lowercase c, that is, uh, must inform a colorblind and genderless society that draws its inspiration from the kind of future that men and women of conscience hope to pass along to succeeding generations. The unembellished history we write will be one that is more accurate and meaningful as a result, as an instructional past that is truly usable. It does not have to be contrived in such a way that makes some folks feel better about themselves and makes others feel guilty. But I'll tell you one thing, it does have to be a history for grown-ups. Uh, how am I doing with time? Great. Okay. Okay, have lots of time. Okay, earlier I had mentioned that, that no one owns the proprietary right to tell how our history unfolded. Texas scholars who are rewriting our history, in fact, uh, have demonstrated an increasing appreciation for the progressive developments that inform the interpretive work of our colleagues in related fields, whether the regional histories or borderland studies, economic or environmental history or human studies and ethnicity, gender and culture. Any reconfigured meta-narrative that draws from such a progressive historiography must acknowledge on one hand the fin de siècle that renders the traditional history unusable and on the other the emergence of a multicultural post-Christian American society of which Texas is a part. Like it or not, that Anglo ascension that began with the filibustering campaigns of the late 18th century has just about run its course. And rest assured, though, that, that a transformation uh, no more portends Anglo-Texan subjugation by ethnic Texans any more than Christianity will be replaced by paganism. It merely means that, that when I talk about this, uh, this multicultural post-Christian American society of which Texas is a part, it merely means that others count and that Christianity is losing its monopoly, if not its followers, in an otherwise Christian society. If one of the fundamental jobs of history is to explain how we got here from over yonder, uh, then the progressive canon represents the ingredients for a new usable past, one that is in search of a gravitational axis that's capable of informing the 21st century Texas mind. If that's not quite clear, consider that Texceptionalism's center of gravity is represented by the Texas Revolution and the 19th century frontier. For the sake of argument, let's, let's say that uh, the focal point for a new meta narrative will revolve around the, uh, the social, economic, and political changes emerging from World War II that transformed Texas into the, the modern place that it is today. The revolution and the 19th century frontier in this new meta narrative uh, have not lost their importance. Matter of fact, they, they uh, remain important in explaining the provenance of traditional values. But they are only one side of a multifaceted experience. Now, I'm not advocating the politicization of our history. I mean, why would I have to? I mean, merely proposing an alternative to the traditional meta narrative will be received by tech exceptionists like a declaration of war. Folks, you think that the State Board of Education's hearings in Austin last year were more fun than going to the circus? Man, just wait. Uh, a new usable past that, that actually possesses the form and context that it presently lacks, one that captures the popular imagination of Texans and appeals to their collective intellect will expose Texceptionalism as a Potemkin republic resting fitfully on a crumbling foundation that is incapable of supporting the weight of its own words. Who knows, perhaps opening up a new frontier or a new front in the discourse of our nation's culture war might finally engage our colleagues in other fields. But let me conclude by proposing to you that uh, American history is in crisis right now. American historiography, that is not American history, American historiography is in crisis. And by extension, so too are the subfields uh, that inform our past, including Texas history. Now, um, from where I'm standing, I see three ways out. I see the kinds of, uh, kind of tops-down history that Daniel Walker Howe gave us uh, that kind of outlines uh, some of the elements of a new meta-narrative. Uh, the second way out is to listen 
to, to the voices of, of some of these, uh, these scholars working in the subfields and, and hope that they can help lead the way out. The third option is to gut our educational system, reducing our past to teaks that inform the iconography that deludes true Texans into advocating secession and keeping them ignorant enough to believe that such an option is, is legal. Uh, well, to challenge my, or excuse me, to chan channel my Moravian great-grandfather, uh, John Yechmenik, a, a native Texan of the old republic uh, who farmed the land uh, outside of Fayetteville, Texas, and founded the Brethren Church there. As he might say, Smelt Vishim Hovno Hlavo. God bless Texas and Sam Houston. Thank you. We have time for a few oral questions before we take our break. Let's see, this is a question for Mr. Cashin. Uh, in Professor Howe's description, he gave us a brief outline of the tremendous difference between the Democrats and the Whigs over the question of Texas. The, and if, the thing that strikes me about this myth history and exceptionalism and jingo religion stuff, that sounds like what the Whigs were doing. How come we've come full circle and have Whigs pushing jingo religion in order to get ordinary people to vote for the economic interests of the very rich people? You see the circle I'm talking about? Is this thing working? Go up to the podium. Like I said, I think the smart aleck answer would be to say, oh, history repeats itself, but I know you want a serious as answer. But uh, um, can, can I defer to, uh, to you to, to answer that, Dr. Howell? It's, it's, uh, I think it's better, uh, might be better expressed by my more experienced and, and far Since more distinguished colleague. we have an colleague. expert on the Whig party here. Yeah. Okay. Um, the amazing thing about the American political parties, if you compare the mid 19th century with today, okay, let's assume that the Republican Party are the heirs of the Whig Party because that's how it worked. Uh, in most of the country, that is, except in the South. In the South, all white people ended up being Democrats after the Civil War. Remember? We, we all remember that. <laughs> okay. But in the, in the rest of the country, the um, former Whigs became Republicans. Uh, the former Democrats remained Democrats, okay? Now, throughout the 19th century, the Democrats were the party of laissez-faire, keep the government small, um, pay off the debt if you can. Andrew Jackson paid off the national debt, um, and, um, but it was rapidly incurred thereafter. That's the only time in history that we haven't had a debt. Um, okay, uh, but at the end of the 19th and beginning of the 20th centuries, uh, a great shift occurred in the party's policies and programs. Starting in 1896, the Democrats embraced big government for the first time, William Jennings Bryan's um, run for the presidency. Um, okay. <clears throat> then, so for a few years, at the beginning of the 20th century, both parties were in favor of big government, government intervention in the economy. That was true of both the party of Woodrow Wilson and the party of Theodore Roosevelt, okay? But uh, then, uh, shortly after the First World War, the Republican Party began to pull back from big government. It became the party of laissez-faire, the party of little government. And of course, um, the Democrats went on to implement the New Deal 
and become uh, all the more emphatically the party of big government. So the parties had swapped positions. But, but, the funny part of it is the parties didn't change their constituencies for the most part. That is to say, the, uh, pa the Whigs and the early Republicans had been the party of um, business people, more affluent people, and the Democrats had been the party of the lower income people. And that remained true even after the parties had swapped positions. The only really big change was that the black people switched from being almost all Republicans to being almost all Democrats. Um, that occurred um, after the New Deal. The New Deal succeeded in detaching that segment of the Republicans' constituency, putting it into the Democrats' constituency. Okay, well, so um, today uh, the, oh, and then of course, um, since the civil rights legislation, um, the South, which remember had been unique in, in all the white people were Democrats, well, that changed too, and the white people um, divided, and some of them became Republicans, uh, so that Southern politics is more like the rest of the country than it used to be. Um, well, um, I, I feel that this is a step toward um, understanding the question posed by the previous speaker. I, I don't know whether the previous speaker will regard it as an answer, but it seems to me um, a constructive step toward an answer. Okay. And you know what, really, the, uh, that, that was a, a perfect example of, of that term meta narrative, too. I, I, I threw that around, but uh, meta narrative by definition is uh, a, a little story that, that tells, uh, that allows you to tell a bigger story. And so basically, uh, what he gave you is a, a encapsulated an umbrella or an outline around uh, which you can, or a skeleton uh, which you can atta attach the, uh, the sinew and the uh, the meat and, and the flesh, and so anyway, thank you. Let me just add one thing, and that's something that's come up again, uh, come up in the last couple of years here. Um, two of our most prominent politicians in Texas have suggested that Texas has a special relationship with the federal government. Uh, as I said a year or two ago, in a 10-minute interview uh, on Chris Matthews' Hardball Show, uh, Tom DeLay said five times that the treaty between the United States and Texas, which brought Texas into the Union, gave Texas certain special rights. There was no treaty. The only treaty of that kind signed between Texas and the United States went down in flames before the United States Senate. Uh, what brought Texas into the Union, as Dr. Howe said today, was a law, a federal law, passed by Congress, by a majority of the House and the majority of the Senate, and signed by the President. There was no treaty. And the same thing has been suggested by Governor Perry in a press conference in which he says Texas has certain special rights with regard to the state's relation with the federal government. They tried that once. And it's not any more true for Texas than it is for South Carolina. Uh, but, but the very fact that that resonates with people who say, oh, yeah, the treaty. I was amazed to find out from my former department head, who's a textbook author, that because Texas is the behemoth, behemoth of textbook purchasers, that his publication company, and this was several years ago, this was in the 60s or 70s, that his, public, his publisher told him in writing an American history textbook to mention the Texas Treaty. He said, there isn't a Texas Treaty. They said, we know, but we want our books to be bought in Texas. <laughs> and the Texans don't trust historians to tell them what's true. They just go with their gut. One more last statement, and because Ty has inspired me. Um, 
we, we did a movie a few years ago about Jose Antonio Navarro for PBS, WGBH Boston, and we brought in one non-Texan, Harry Watson, from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill uh, to be our kind of American history expert to tell us the background of Jacksonian America. And as we were having dinner over in Chapel Hill with the producer Joseph Tavares from San Antonio and those others of us who were talking heads in the, uh, in the PBS documentary, Harry said, uh, Jim, can you maybe explain Texas politics and Texas culture to me in a nutshell? <laughs> and I said, yes, I think I can. Uh, where I grew up, if you ask a, a, a Texan a question, um, he won't tell you what he thinks. He'll start his answer with this. Well, I feel like, and then he will tell you what he feels like. And it comes from the gut. Uh, it comes from feeling. It doesn't usually come from a rational answer. Now, I realize this is a broad brush that paints a lot of people unfairly. But I'm convinced that for much of our state and much of our culture, and I go back to Henrietta, Henrietta as often as I can, uh, and, I, and I see it in the media as well as among my friends and neighbors, uh, I think that there is a very strong strain of gut feeling when it comes to both history and politics in Texas.